stand if you're able to, and let's turn to 439. We're going to sing Stepping in the Light. Great to see you here this evening. Let's lift it up here on that first verse now. Trying to walk in the steps of the Savior. Let's lift it up. Trying to walk in the steps of the Savior. Trying to believe your and King. Shaping our lives by His blessed example. Happy, how happy. It is great to see you here this evening. I want to uh, just ask if you could remember Miss Connie Deffenbaugh in prayer. She called me today and told me that she had what is a mini stroke. And so um, they, uh, she was in the hospital, but then they sent her home um, after the stroke. And so I think she stabilized. But if you could keep her in prayer, I asked her what we could get for her, what she needed. And that was what she requested, was prayer. And so... 
I told her tonight we'll give her an extra helping for sure of that. And so uh, if you could remember her in prayer, you, um, uh, Miss Connie Deffenbaugh, and then I ha I just found out about that, and so I don't know anything really else yet. I asked her if we could bring food or anything else by, but she said that uh, she had people that were helping her cover that. And so if you could remember her in prayer and um, lift her up. And then, Brother Martins, if you could go ahead and help us with the rest of the prayer request tonight and then pray for the offering. And then just a reminder, our Wednesday night offering, all of the cash that comes in in the Wednesday night offering goes to the Others Fund just to be a help and a blessing to others, those that are in need in the community. Thank you. All right. Do we have other prayer requests tonight? I have one. Um, the uh, I, I requested prayer for Dorothy Lurkins, who was critically ill and not expected to live, and she did pass away this morning. So if you could remember the Lurkins family and the loss of their loved one, please. Are there others? Yes, Martha. For what? Okay, anything else? Yes, Casey. My sister, she has a, a CT scan on Friday. They found a spot on her MRI, and they just want to look at her a little bit to see what it might be. So I go from there, and she kind of has a migraine situation. And then uh, my cousin Tara, she's on the transplant list for her kidney, and she just had a lot of terrible health issues. So then she also tested positive. Okay, Casey, thank you. Yes? Okay. Okay. Others? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay, are there others? Just remember to keep Charity in prayer. She's doing better, but just keep her in prayer. Okay. Okay, all right. Yes, sir. Okay. okay. Others. Yes, Nick. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Yes, Ashton. Who? Nate. Nate. Yes. I, I heard about that. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Riley. Okay. Okay. Anything else? All right. Well, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do come to you just uh, so grateful, Lord, that we have the freedom to worship and to meet in this place, Lord, together. So many places in the, in the country are still locked down, Lord, and I just pray that you would uh, be with us and be with them, too, as they go through this time, and thank you that we can come together and meet and, and worship you. And, 
Lord, I thank you for your goodness and for your grace and mercy in our behalf. Lord, you're so good to us, and you've seen us through so much, Lord, and I pray that you'll continue to walk with us as we go through this new year. Pray that you will just keep your hand on our nation. Lord, the request tonight was we've, we've I'm sure we've all heard of the the threats of riots through in, in the capitals and at, at, at our capital, nation's capital. And I just pray, Father, that you would draw people together. Lord, help us not to not to get so far apart and help us, Lord, to come together as a nation and, and realize that we need each other and that we need uh, to, we, we need our nation, we need our freedoms, and most of all, we need you. Lord, we need you in this country so bad. And I ask, Father, for revival. I, I pray that somehow, some way, that revival would break out in this great nation, and, Lord, before it's ever everlastingly too late. So, Lord, we do pray. I do pray for calm, and I pray it will be a peaceful uh, transition of power, and, and uh, I, pray for, I pray for President Biden, Lord, I, the president-elect. I pray for him that he'll do right, and that he'll honor you, and I pray for all of our elected leaders. That's what we're supposed to do. And so, Lord, I pray for all of them, Lord, that you would keep your hand on them. Lord, we know that the heart of the king is in the hands of the Lord. And so I just pray that you would work, Lord. And I, none of this is, is unknown to you, and none of it's a surprise. And so I just pray, Father, that your hand of help and your hand of mercy and compassion will be upon us, Lord, as we, and help would be uh, as we go through this time. And Lord, um, I lift up Miss Connie to you. I pray for her as she's had this stroke. I just, Lord, we love her. We just, we ask that you would just keep your hand on her and help her through this time. She's been so faithful, and I just pray, Lord, that you would just uh, work in her health and help her to get over this and that it would, has not done a lot of damage, and I just pray for her that you would encourage her heart, Lord, tonight uh, in this time. And then for the Lurkins family, I pray for Brian and his brothers and Bob, and I just pray for all of the family, Lord, as they as they uh, are feeling the loss of Dorothy. I just pray that you would comfort them and strengthen them, Lord, and and I know they're looking to you, and so I just pray that you would just give mercy and grace in this time to them. And then uh, for Casey's sister who's having a CT scan, I pray you give wisdom to the doctors and give a good report, at least give them uh, a good report and also a way to, to, uh, to deal with whatever the problem is she's having. And I pray that you'll work too, Lord. You're the great physician. And I pray that you would help and that your power will be upon her as she goes through this time. Then for Kara, who is uh, on the list for a transplant for a kidney, but now she's got COVID. And there's just a lot of things going on in her life. And I just pray, Father, that you would intervene and you would help. You'd strengthen. You'd give wisdom to those who treat her and that you'll help her through this COVID and be able to receive this kidney when it becomes available. Then for Susie's mom, who's feeling bad, I pray for her that you would help her to get better and just uh, help her to get over whatever it is she's got. And for Jerry Lowther, who's going through surgery tomorrow, I pray that it would be successful, that he'll come through it safely without a lot of bad effects. And so I just pray that you'd help him, Lord, and be with him, and that they'll be able to take care of this cancer that he has. Then for Miss Charity, I pray for her, Lord. I just lift her up to you. I thank you that she's feeling better. But, Lord, uh, I just pray that you'd help her not to have so many of these reactions or not to have any more at all. That could be your will, Lord. But I just pray that you would intervene in her behalf, that your hand of help and mercy and blessing would be upon her, Lord, in these days. And then for Alice, who's dealing with this shot reaction, I pray for her that she'll get over it quickly, and uh, then for Nikki and for Riley, the unspoken request, I pray that you would be with each one of those, Lord, and according to the need, that you'll answer, that you'll work, that you'll do whatever's necessary to, to meet the need that's there. 
And uh, then for Nate, who has got COVID, been tested for it, Lord, I pray for him. And then just pray that uh, his family would, uh, if they have to go through it, they'd go through it safely. And and uh, and if otherwise, Lord, just pray that maybe they won't even get it. But you know what's best. Lord, you know what's best for the times we live in. And I just... Uh, I just, I just lift it up to you. And I ask you to work, and I ask you to, to have your will and your way. It's your kingdom will come, and your will will be done in earth and as, as it is in heaven. And uh, I ask you now to bless this offering, uh, the gift and the giver. Pray that you would just guide and direct our lives in the days ahead. And I ask it in the strong and precious and wonderful name of the Lord Jesus, which is above all names. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand one more time now and turn to 113. <clears throat> 113, we're going to sing Sweet Hour of Prayer. What a good song to be singing. I love this song. On the first verse now. Sweet Hour of Prayer. Sweet Hour of Prayer. That Trust his grace, I'll cast on him my every care. I love that. Lift it up one more time here on that second now. 
Great song for the message tonight. Let's grab our Bibles and go to Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 5. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 5. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 5. And I'd like to read two verses, Matthew chapter 6, verse number 5, and verse number 6. And uh, the Bible says in Matthew 6, 5, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5 and 6, from the lips of Jesus himself, some very special instruction when it comes to prayer. And... It talks about public prayer here uh, and the, the Pharisees who love to do it. But I'd like to look with you at the most difficult and most important prayer in your life, and that is secret prayer is what Jesus called it. And so I'd like to look tonight with you at secret prayer and give you a challenge for 2021, something for you to shoot for at least for maybe the next five years and a half weeks or so. I'm going to give you a challenge for, uh, for this year that you can make. So let's pray, ask the Lord's blessing, and we'll get right into the message here on secret prayer. Thank you, Lord, again for the chance to be here. Thank you so much for the way that you've helped us, even, even with Miss Connie. Lord, I'm just thankful that you've given her a place where she could get care and that she's okay. And Lord, I just ask that you'd put your hand of help on her, that you'd give her strength. And I pray, Lord, that you would just give her exactly what she needs. I pray that you'd give her help and you'd give her grace. And then I pray for uh, those who are here tonight and just ask that you would speak to our hearts as well. And I pray that you would help each one of us to grow in this area of secret prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. I also wanted to say it's good to see Miss Ann back. 
Good to see her back, and then great to have Liz back from Mexico, right? All right. Glad to see you back as well. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 5, Jesus is going to give warning about doing good things, but doing good things in the wrong way. Now, it's said that, you know, a deed well done is its own reward, and there is some truth to that for sure. But you can do a right thing in a wrong way, and doing a right thing in a wrong way can steal the real blessing from you. For example, um, I don't have any problem at all if somebody says, hey, it's uh, the end of the year, and I need to give some money because it's going to get me a tax benefit. My tax man says it's actually better for me to give, and so I need to give. I don't, you know, great. People can give for tax savings. All right, that's, that's wonderful. That's, that's not really the highest purpose, though, of Christian giving. Yeah. Right? It, that's actually, uh, and it can be done just for the sense of to help yourself. And, uh, and so the Bible talks about here in verse number 1 of chapter 6, Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. And talks about the danger of giving with the wrong motive. Giving in such a way as to just simply garner credit for yourself. And then he's going to talk about in verse number 5 what we read, praying. And believe it or not, you can even pray with wrong motives. And, and so this, I just want to say right off the bat, is not something everybody, the specific temptation is not something everybody here will face. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, the warning is when you pray, don't pray like the hypocrites are. And the hypocrites that he would be referring to would be any of the people who relished the chance to get in front of people and to wax eloquent in their prayers. Now, you know, I think, what those prayers are. Um, for example, a little pet peeve of mine, congressional prayers. And prayers done even that, well, I use congressional prayers, but any political prayer, all right? Let me just put it that way. To me, it's always odd when a person is reading their prayer. Okay? It's just odd. And that's not even talking about the amen or a woman thing, all right? That's a whole nother, that's a whole, whole nother thing. I'm not even going there, all right? Uh, but wow, that, was, that one was fun, all right? I'm not, I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about, I've watched. I've watched as people got up to pray, to pray, that was their task, and they read what they had to say. And you could tell, they thought, well, what do I want to say now that everybody's listening to me? And so what am I, how am I going to word this? And so political prayers, I've, I've, I've never heard a single political prayer that really, I wasn't even confident that it made it past the people that heard it. All right. I'm not saying they don't exist. I just had never heard any of them. They seem like they were done to impress people. And you've probably heard some other prayers before, and you hear them in church or you hear them in a prayer meeting or maybe on television, and uh, they're really, really impressive prayers. You know what I mean? I mean, they're really impressive prayers. God, we beseech thee, the maker of heaven and earth, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the sovereign of sovereigns. Oh, it's going really well. Everybody's loving all these names. They think I'm going to run out. I'm not. Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Sid Canoe, actual names from the Old Testament. Elohim and Adonai, God. We thank thee for thy bountiful blessings which thou hast abundantly poured out upon each and every one of us. Thank you for opening the skies and sending the delicious rain to delight the parched ground. You know what I mean. You've heard those kinds of prayers. Now, the reason, the reason there's a problem with that is because when you pray, who are you talking to? God. All right? 
Could you talk to anybody like that and then take you seriously? Of course not. Of course not. The notion that we have to, now look, I'm not saying we shouldn't be reverent in prayer to God. Of course we should. But there is a sense of false reverency and there is sometimes this, this pressure to try to appear super spiritual and really on top of things and really impress people. And I said in the beginning, this is not something everyone here will battle with. There are, I can think of at least four or five people right now who I know who if I said I need somebody to pray, the first thought that went through their mind would be anybody but me. All right? I've had several people who, who have actually come to me and said, um, please, you know, don't ask me to pray publicly. Now, is that because they're unspiritual? Obviously. No, of course that's not it, all right? It's not that at all. It's just they don't like the idea of speaking in front of people, and the idea of praying out loud puts pressure on them that they're, at that time they just didn't feel capable of handling, or, you know, any other number of reasons, all right? This is not something that everybody will struggle with, the particular warning in the beginning. But there certainly are, and some of you, if you're honest in your own heart, know you wouldn't mind attention and you wouldn't mind approval. This is a normal, everyday human desire. Don't believe me? Why does social media exist? Because right? we want approval and we want affection and we want people's admiration. The ability to get likes and support and the reactions that they do now, right? They've got more than just likes. You can heart, hug, smile. I, you know, I don't know. I've, they've got all different kinds of reactions that you can do. Uh, and, uh, and so that's a normal thing. And so it's not a surprise that when people are praying, there is a tendency to try to perform. And so uh, I want to make sure I sound spiritual and say the right things and do all the rest of it. Listen, when you pray, you're talking to God. All of the clear teaching from the Bible all te backs this up. You speak to God. God hears you. Let your heart be poured out to Him. And the most effective prayer is just honest prayer from your heart. But that being said, the hardest time to pray isn't publicly. It's not when your family um, is uh, seated at a meal. It's not in a time of crisis when fear is pressing hard. But the hardest time to pray is in what the Bible calls the closet, secret prayer, where no one else can see you but God and where no one else can hear you but God. And this is what Jesus commands us in verse number six to do. He says, when you pray, enter into your closet, shut your door, and pray to your Father which is in secret, and your Father which sees in secret shall reward thee openly. Now, there is nothing wrong with praying publicly. There's nothing wrong with praying corporately in a group, leading a group in prayer. All those things were done in the Bible. There's certainly nothing wrong with praying with a person. Again, all that happened in the Bible. But there is absolutely something wrong if this part of your prayer life is missing. If the only time you pray is when you sit down to eat. And if you think I'm joking, the first thing that comes to at least many Christians' mind is, no, no, I pray. I always ask God's blessing for my food. And I'm glad you do that. All right, seriously, I'm glad you do that. But really, but really, if that's what your prayer life consists of, it's about as impressive as your kids saying, but I chewed my food before I swallowed it. Yeah, I'm glad you did that. You're definitely supposed to, but you should do more than just that. Now, here's the rub. Ready? I can pray publicly. You can pray publicly. We can listen to that. Does that tell you how we pray privately? No. Does that tell you if we pray? I pray privately. No. Is there a little meter over each one of your heads that I can tell? Whoa, they're real prayed up. They've been really hitting the prayer closet. Only one person has that, and I think he just put it up right now. Nobody has that meter, right? We don't know this. Who knows this? Answer, of course, is God knows it. And Leonard Ravenhill, in um, 
in his book said, the secret of prayer is secret prayer. His book, Why Revival Tarries. And I loved that statement. The secret of prayer is secret prayer. I'll just show you a few, few examples of this in Scripture so you know um, what it looks like. If you're in Matthew, go to Matthew chapter 14 and verse number 23. Matthew 14, verse number 23. There are several examples of people who taught us by example what it was to pray in secret. A quick word about this, praying in secret. The Bible says that you enter into your closet and shut your door, all right? Does this mean that there is indeed a holy place to pray and it's your closet? Not necessarily. The closet just represents a place that no one else will interrupt you in. It's a place where you can be alone. It's a place where you can talk to God, where you're not going to be seen, and a place where you can get alone with God. So you can enter into the prayer closet by taking a walk. You can enter the prayer closet by taking a drive. You can enter the prayer closet by seated in your kitchen table, if you're seated there by yourself. It's just some place where you can talk to God clearly, freely, and you're not doing it to be seen of others. All right? So, Matthew 14, verse 23. Quick, quick examples of this. Uh, I'll start in verse 22. And straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there, say the word, alone. Jesus was praying alone. He sent the multitudes away. He wasn't asking God for any miracles. There were no group of people that needed to be fed. In fact, all those things had already happened, and now he'd sent the disciples away. And what did Jesus go up to do? He went up to the mountain. Again, it's a good example. Here's going into a mountain. is the same thing as going into a closet. It's a place where he could be alone, and a place where he could let requests be made known before the Lord. How about uh, Acts chapter 10 and verse number 9? Acts chapter 10 and verse number 9. So Jesus goes to a mountain and he prays alone. Acts chapter 10 and verse number 9. It says, On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. So pre Peter gets alone to pray with God. In Acts chapter 10, you're going to see a sheet comes down from heaven and all the vegetarians start to cry because Jesus tells, God tells Peter, rise Peter, kill and eat. All right? Anyway, I digress. And so, uh, so anyway, uh, and so, so he, he's having this time where God appears to him. Where did he appear to him? Well, he appeared to him when he was in the prayer closet, except his prayer closet wasn't a closet. It was just on top of the roof. Jesus got alone with God on the mountain. Peter got alone with God on the top of his house on the roof. Uh, go with me here to, let's go to Genesis. We'll flip to the beginning. Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter number 32, and Jacob has gotten news that his brother Esau is coming to see him. This makes him incredibly worried, and so uh, he comes to this place, Genesis 32, and look with me here at verse number 22. It says, and he rose up that night and took his two wives and his two women servants and his eleven sons and passed over the ford Jabbok. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over all he had. And Jacob was left, what's the word there? Alone. And there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. You can read the story, but this, uh, verse number 27, he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince thou hast power with God and with men and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? 
and he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen, here it is, God face to face, and my life is preserved. In this case, it took on the form of an actual wrestling match, but he wrestled with God in supplication. Where did he do it? He did it over near a brook after he had sent his wife and his children away believing that he was going to die the next day from the things that were going to happen, he got alone with God and begged for God's help until he got it. And so uh, we see that Jacob goes to a brook, uh, uh, Jesus goes to a mountain, uh, Peter goes on top of a roof, and then go with me to 2 Kings chapter 4. I'll give you another example. 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse number thirty. 32. 2 Kings 4, 32. Elisha has heard the news that the, um, the woman who has shown great care for him, that her child has died. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse number 32. It says, And when Elisha was come into the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. He went in, therefore, and shut the door upon them twain and prayed unto the Lord. And you can read the prayer where he asked for God to save the boy and bring the boy back from the dead. And, of course, God hears the prayer and he does it. And so uh, Jesus prayed on the top of a mountain. Jacob prayed uh, by the a brook. Uh, Peter prayed on the top of a roof. Elisha enters into the house alone, and he prays, and he asks God. He stretches himself out in the boy's room, and he asks for God to save him. I said all that to say this. Wherever it is, got to figure that out, but that's not hard. Find a place where you can get alone with God. I have four children. I have four children. I can get up before my children and do it seems like every morning my sons, or every night my sons tell me what time they're going to wake up, and every morning I wake them up. And I wish that was a joke. They feel the need to come in and tell me every morning what time they're going to get up. We're going to wake up at this time. And then about 30 minutes after that time, I wake them up every day. And it's the same conversation. My alarm didn't go off. I said, no, your alarm went off. You just turned it off. But anyway, I digress. So I said all that to say, uh, I could get up before them, and I could pray and talk to God, and I could do that alone. That's a way that I can do it. If your children get up when you get up, then you've got to find a different way. Maybe you shut the door to your room, and you kneel down. Maybe you enter into your closet, and you get alone with God. It may be that you get behind your vehicle when you're driving to work or going out and about, and you it's just you and God. You find a place where you can get alone. There may be a place that you have at work that you can go when you take a break and no one else is there that you can get alone with God. I don't know where your prayer closet is, but you've got to find one. It's not hard. You can have a prayer closet. In a busy house, in a packed house, you can have a prayer closet. You don't need to have a prayer closet built onto your home. All right? You could. If you can afford it, more power to you. But you don't have to. All right? You just need a place where you can get alone with the Lord. And the pattern throughout Scripture is that people got alone with God and they brought their needs before Him. And the only reason we know about it is because the Holy Spirit of God inspired the writers of Scripture to tell us they did it. They weren't doing it to be seen. They weren't doing it for a show. They weren't doing it to teach. They were just doing it to get alone with God. So why does Jesus who practiced this again and again. He would pray sometimes late into the night. Other times he would get up early in the morning, a great while before day. Other times he would send others away and he would pray alone. Why does Jesus tell us to pray in secret? To not pray in front of others, specifically have time where it's just alone with God. Well, we go to Matthew chapter 6 and the Bible points out here uh, two different things. The first one is it helps us to avoid a show. It helps us to avoid a show. Prayer is you talking to God, and God sees your heart, and you cannot fool God. There is a temptation, though, to be seen by others, but that temptation is eliminated when nobody else is listening to you pray. All right? Maybe you're a better Christian than I am, but I can tell you I pray differently when I pray alone. I do. I'll say things um, 
more candidly or I'll say things without thinking about them as much. I pray differently when I'm alone. Now, I'm not saying if you prayed with me, I was putting on a show. I sure hope not. Uh, but it helps us to avoid that temptation. You need to get alone with God. And at some point, there, by the way, even old habits sometimes come in. When I'm praying by myself, I find myself saying things. And it's like God says, what are you doing? It's just you and me. Yeah, that's a good point. I, maybe, the, Hopefully it's not just me. There have been times I got to go pray alone. And the first thing I did, Lord, would you bless the food? Well, unless I'm eating a midnight snack, I don't know why I asked that. I've done that before. That was embarrassing, but thankfully God just it was me and God, and then I blew it by telling everybody else. But but the point is, is that you can get alone with God. You can talk to the Lord. You, it helps you to avoid a show. It helps you to, to keep from saying things to be seen of men. And the Bible makes it very clear. When that happens in our prayer, you got your reward. People saw you, and they were impressed or they weren't impressed, whatever it was, but that's all you got. It helps you to avoid a show. But it also helps to do something else that is incredibly important in the time in which we live. And that's that it helps you to avoid distractions. It helps you to avoid distractions. Uh, did you ever notice that you don't decorate your closets? In fact, I've been in some really, really nice buildings. And at best, the nicest buildings I've been in, the closets were just okay. Many places, the closet is the least you know, like there's tape still up and things didn't quite get finished. It's just plain. It's just a closet. Why don't we decorate it? It's not for show. It's just to hold stuff. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm sure some organizer person has come up with a plan to start decorating your closets. We're going to really go with the spring theme in your closet. Get it out of there. Nobody goes into the closet. It just holds the clothes. That's it. All right? You don't decorate a closet. You don't put a TV in a closet. I hope. If you have TVs in your closet, you have too many TVs. You don't put TVs in your closet. You know what? You, your closet is probably the only single purpose room in your home. I mean, you'll shower, but you'll also you know, get yourself ready in the bathroom. In your room, you might relax, you might sleep, you might do things, you might have certain things that you collect. Your Every other room has multiple functions. Your closet just has one purpose. That's it. it holds clothes. Or holds stuff, I guess, if, depending what's in your closet. And so it's a place that you can go to that's not high traffic. How many times have you ever had somebody say, oh, I was going to use the closet? No, nobody says that. It's a place that you can go to get alone with God. And in the time that we live, I'm going to just speak for myself, it is easy to get distracted. It's easy to get distracted. Whether that's you, you know, turn on a TV. You don't have anything to do, but you just turn on a TV looking for a distraction. So you flip the channels. Or you uh, go to YouTube and you look for things that catch your eye to watch. Or you get on some social media and you just pull down and refresh. Scroll, 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 scroll. Oh, there we go. Pull down again, refresh, scroll. It's easy to get distracted. I mean, it just is. It's very easy to get distracted. You know where you don't get distracted? You don't get distracted in your closet. You don't walk in your closet and say, now what did I come in here to do? It's one thing. You might have forgotten what clothes you went in there to get. Maybe you're getting older, but you went, remember why you went in there. You went in there for a purpose. And so the Bible says, not just go into your closet, but then it says you shut your door. The purpose of shutting your door is to avoid distractions. Look, I, I am not opposed to uh, people who have their Bibles on their phones. I have two different Bible apps on my phone. I'm not opposed to that. I'll read my Bible on my phone sometimes. There are people who, maybe even right now, you're bringing your phone to church as a Bible, and you use your phone as your Bible. All right? I'm not saying it's sinful to do that, but I'm telling you there's something really wonderful about a single-purpose Bible, and that's that it never gives me any 
alerts. It never gets me a text message. It never gives me a phone call. There is no distraction to be found here. The battery never dies on this thing. Right, just throwing that out there. Right, if you're using your phone, all right, okay, it's fine. I'm not saying you can't. I'm just saying it's really, really nice when you pray to get alone with God where there is no distractions. You can bring in a Bible. You can bring in a hymn book. But you're not going to get distracted. It's single-purpose things. And when we pray, look, you can get distracted. It's easy to do. And so, uh, the Bible says, go into your closet. Go to a place where you can focus. Go to a place where you can concentrate. Talk to the Lord. Why do we do this? Uh, what happens? Well, a couple things ha take place here. Uh, when you get in the closet, it forces you to be honest. You can't make traction in prayer without honesty. You, you just can't. Furthermore, you can't fool God. I mean, you can't fool God. And the Bible tells us that, um, that when we do this, God rewards us for it. That's what the text says very clearly. It says, but thou, verse 6, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. When thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. God says if you want answers to your prayers others can see, pray about it when no one can can see. If you want God to move in a big way, then get along with Him in a quiet way and pour out your heart before Him. Pray, pray, pray. Talk to God. I don't know if it just so happens the time in which we live. It may be just that. But overwhelmingly, I'm being reminded of how much more I should be praying. What's the future going to hold? 2020 was a, an odd year. We as a country did things we've never done in uh, really, really in our history. 2021, I love how everybody thought, oh, 2021, it'll be great. And I think, well, I mean, the day flipped, the number changed, but I don't know that a whole lot has fundamentally changed yet. And I don't, I don't know that it has. Now, maybe it has, maybe it hasn't. I don't, time will tell. I don't think that it has necessarily. Um, and then all these other things happened. Uh, I have had... I have had a couple people come to me, I've had three, with what sounded to me like just conspiracy theory type stuff. Like, mark it down, in the next three days, big stuff's going to happen, you heard it here, I got it from a good source, whatever. Um, and uh, so I've heard that, and, and I said, I, I don't think so, time will tell. And it's, by the way, it's been three days. And so, right, I mean, so far. I and mean, I was told today was the day. So looks like Joe, Bi Joe Biden's going to actually be our president. It's what it's been looking like for a long time. That's going to happen, all right? So, you know, what do we do? Oh, boy, well, we got to think about it. What's, what's the impact? You know, remember he said that he's going to, he wants to get rid of fossil fuels. Well, I mean, that would hurt Oklahoma a lot. Oh, boy, well, that's going to that's gonna really hurt our industry. What do we do? Here's what you do. You ready? Just talk to God about it. Talk to God about it. Oh, boy, I heard news that the uh, virus has mutated, and I know people who have got it once, and now they've caught it twice. Oh, boy, what does that mean? Here's what you do. Talk to God about it. Talk to God about it. I have been amazed at how much more I need to be praying. And so I, I, my challenge to you is, yeah, I'd love for you to pray every day and to commit time in prayer every day for the rest of the year. I think that's wonderful, and I think you ought to. But let me give you a shorter-term goal. You ready? How about make it a goal to pray every day for at least 15 minutes of private prayer, secret prayer, until Valentine's Day? I double-checked. It's five weeks and some change. Five weeks and some change, where you get alone with God every day. Of course, you can keep doing it past then, but make a goal and say, I want to talk to God every day. And you say, what should I ask the Lord? Here's, I'm going to, with God's help, I'm going to try to give you in the little bulletin each week a thing that you can pray for. Here's one to pray for this week. You ready? God, would you open my eyes and help me to see like you would want me to see? So I've asked the Lord to do that. And you know what I've found when I asked the Lord to do that? A whole lot of times I was fixated on some problem in my life. 
and boy, there's this problem, and oh, the problems of this problem, the impacts of this problem, what am I going to do about it? And when I asked God and brought it to him in prayer, he said, I see a totally different problem. Yeah, you've got this problem, but your biggest problem is in your own heart and how you're responding to it. And you know what I found out? God's true. <laughs> He's right. So I've just been praying, Lord, would you help me to see things like you want me to see them? I've been asking the Lord that, and I'm going to ask that this week uh, and, uh, and through the rest of Sunday and, and the rest of this next week. God, would you just help me? Look, when you enter into that closet, wherever it may be, it can be in your car, it can be in your office, it can be in, in your room, it can be at your kitchen table, it can be at a break room, it can be someplace where you can talk to God, it can be in the woods, it can be walking around the block, it can be someplace where you can get alone with God, wherever that place is. It can be on the rooftop if you're an adult. Kids, don't go to your rooftop. I did not tell you to go to your rooftop. Because you know all the kids are going to want that one. I got it, I'm preaching, I'm... Praying like the pastor said, followed by jumping down. All right, don't do that. I'm not saying that, all right? I would say it could be on a mountain, but that's a lot harder to pull off around here. It might be easier to do it in a canyon than it would be to do it in a mountain. Same effect, same effect. You know. That's what I say. We, we've got the, um, oh, what's the one Hinton, just outside of Hinton? Red Rock Canyon. We got Red Rock Canyon. Seriously, do you know that when you get down the bottom of a canyon, it looks up, looks just like mountains? but it doesn't block the view like mountains do. We can see the weather when we get to the top. If you think about it, canes are better. Anyway, uh, take that Colorado. <laughs> People tell me how great Colorado is. Whatever, all right? The mountains are a lot better when they're in the ground. And so, anyway, uh, get, get down to the bottom of a canyon. You can get alone with God. Find some place that you can get alone with God. But here's the thing. You, can, you, you say, I got so many things to pray for, I don't need anything more. All right, fine, great. But if you could use something to pray, ask the Lord this week, Help me to see like you would have me to see. Do you know how many times in the Bible when people, when God answered that prayer, things changed? You remember the, uh, the men, the, 50, the, the men had surrounded Elisha, and he says to the servant, says, what are we going to do, what are we going to do? And so Elisha prays, Lord, would you just open his eyes? And he saw the soldiers surrounding them, but then God opened his eyes, and he saw the army of angelic soldiers surrounding them. And he went from, what are we going to do, to what are they going to do? They're in big trouble. They're surrounded by angels. It's incredible how many times when we ask God for help, he changes our perspective. Ask the Lord to do that. I believe firmly, I believe firmly that in the time in which we live, there are so much lies. Truth has fallen in the street. Things that are lies are now being said as true. Things that are true are now being said as lies. I believe in this time, it is an incredible time to be a Christian. At some point, people are going to say, you know, all the things that I've been being told, I tried them, and I'm miserable, and they're not working. And they're going to look for truth, and guess what? We have it. You know, the darker the night, the brighter the light. I'm really looking forward to 2021. I think it is a wonderful time for churches. As long as you speak and teach and preach what's true, people need truth. That will never change, and it is doubly true when everything around is pumping out that which is lies. I'm just saying, if you'll ask God to help you see, he'll answer the prayer. Amen. So ask the Lord, God, would you open my eyes? That's the prayer uh, that I've been praying and will continue to pray. And I'll try to give you some, just some challenges like that and put them in the bolts and short prayers, nothing elaborate, but short prayers. Lord, open my eyes. Help me to see like you would have me to see. We'll face, a, we'll face a danger in front of us, and we look at the danger and we think, oh boy, this is big. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Ask God. Help me to see like you'd have me to see, and you'll see that every chance there is an opportunity for danger, it's also a chance for me to increase my faith. It is. There are opportunities that God gives us if we'll see them as such. Well, I got this person, and they are just so rude to me, and they will not stop. You know, they give you a special opportunity to love your enemies, something you can't do when you don't have enemies. They give you a chance to pray for somebody who, who uses you and despitefully speaks against you. That's something you can't do unless somebody uses you and despitefully speaks against you. It's a special opportunity if you'll learn to see things how God would have you to see them.
Paul said that when he was writing. He said, brethren, I would that you knew the things that have happened unto me have fallen out. They're looking, oh, it's so awful, you're in jail. This is so awful, people have turned against you. This is so awful, uh, people have gathered together in church and have now started saying that you're a coward and that you're, you're bold in your letters and all these hurtful things. And he said, brethren, I would you know that the things that have happened unto me have fallen out rather to the furtherance of the gospel. They were seeing all of the pain that came into it, and Paul said, no, you don't realize because all these things happened, more people got saved. More people got saved. It happened to the furtherance of the gospel. It just changes when we see things from God's perspective. And so my challenge to you is to make it a point in 2021 to have secret prayer. It doesn't make for a good bumper sticker. In fact, it's probably confusing. Secret prayer. Uh, But you need it. You need it. Jesus gave us the example of it. And it will make a difference in your life. When you're not praying to be heard by others, you're not praying to be seen by others, you're not worried about how many names of God that you know. By the way, do you remember when Jesus gave the model prayer? Here's how he started it. Our Father. That's how he started it. God, you don't have to know a bunch of names. You just have to know who you're talking to. And he'll hear you. But make it a point to get some time alone with God. Here's what you'll find when you do. We need it. It's desperate. I mean, we need it. I am watching some of the decisions people are making. And I am convinced prayers had nothing to do with their decisions. Nothing. They're just looking at everything. They're weighing their options. They're doing what they think is best. They never talk to God about it. You'd be shocked at how much God would straighten you out if you asked him. So let's get alone with God where he can speak to us and we can speak to him. And the Bible says that our Father who sees in secret will reward us openly. Would you bow your heads for prayer?